adult safeguarding. We'll begin with a definition of abuse. Abuse is an act that knowingly or unknowingly causes harm, endangers life or infringes on the rights of a vulnerable person. It can take many different forms and be at different levels of seriousness. Abusers, perpetrators of abuse. Anybody can abuse. People who knowingly abuse and those who perpetrate abuse unknowingly, these could be untrained care staff, poor practice, informal carers or unpaid carers, or the people who use services. Types and indicators of abuse. We'll start with physical abuse. Types of physical abuse can include hitting, kicking, punching, restraint, burning, overuse of medication, pulling hair, pushing, biting, scratching, rough handling. It's important we look at indicators of such abuse. These might include unexplained injuries, not consistent with a person's explanation, people flinching when you approach them, certain changes in behaviour that we notice, physical signs such as burns, cigarette burns, carpet burns, rope burns, scalds, weight loss that doesn't seem to have a cause, unexplained fractures, repeated admissions to hospital, Bruises that suggest systematic injury, usually in the shape of objects, finger marks for example, under or overuse of medication, people being in pain, people who cover their body, unwillingness to cooperate with personal care, emotional abuse. Types of emotional abuse might include name-calling, ridiculing someone, using words and actions as weapons against people, Shouting, swearing, belittling people, mocking them or threatening them, bullying them, intimidating them, taunting them, or even just ignoring them. Indicators for this type of abuse might include people being tearful, people being ambivalent to a carer, people experiencing low self esteem, loss of interest in enjoyed activities. Passivity and resignation, sleep disturbance, people seeking reassurance, fearfulness, withdrawal and anxiety, undue attention and gifts given to a vulnerable person. Sexual abuse. Types of sexual abuse can include rape, the touching of genitals or breasts, using objects against people, oral sex, sexual acts. Pornographic material, sexual harassment, sexual language, the taking of photographs, filming people. Indicators might include overtly sexualised behaviour on the part of a person, full or partial disclosure or hints of sexual abuse, changes again in usual behaviour of people, visible signs such as torn or stained underclothing, Withdrawal from activities, bruising or other injuries in genital areas, sexually transmitted diseases, urinary infections, pregnancy of someone who lacks capacity to consent, disturbed sleep patterns, again unexplained gifts, people suffering from depression, financial abuse. Types of financial abuse might include robbery, fraud. Spending of allowances and savings. Use of people's rewards cards. Disposing of people's property. Theft. Indicators to look for might include unusual bank account activity on the part of the person concerned. Sudden unexplained ability to pay bills. People transferring house deeds, changing wills. Unexplained shortage of money. Despite their income being adequate, Disappearance of bank statements, checkbooks, bank cards, benefit books. 
Reluctance on the part of a carer or family member to give financial information. Lack of possessions which you know they can afford. Loss of possessions. Neglect. Types of neglect could include not giving of medication. Not attending to physical care needs. Lack of information. Not providing appropriate equipment or goods. Poor nutrition. Hydration. Lack of activities. Lack of access to clean or appropriate clothing. Conversation deprivation. Indicators of such abuse might include poor furnishing or poor housing conditions, inadequate or dirty clothing and bedding, non-cooperation with services from informal carers, lack of access to the vulnerable person by professionals, visible signs such as pressure sores and ulcers, weight loss, failure to receive medication, failure to access medical provision, Sensory deprivation, poor personal hygiene, challenging behaviours, depression. Organisational abuse. Types of organisational abuse might include uniform treatment of people, possessions and clothes being used by others, strict routines, expectations that staff can withhold privileges and impose punishments, not providing individual activities. Indicators of such abuse might include Regimes that suit staff rather than service users. A lack of leadership within the organisation. Understaffing. Inappropriate language when referring to users and carers. Lack of a stimulating environment. Lack of personal clothing and clothes that are in poor condition. Badly managed continence. Badly managed health conditions. A lack of quality and choice of food. Poor drug management. Poorly trained staff who don't understand the service users they're working with. Failure to assist with care tasks. We now look at the legal perspective. A working together for adults. This was a consultation report on the No Secrets document in 2009. Many respondents to this involved in the consultation report wanted very different solutions from those used with children. Many spontaneously said things like, I do not want to be treated as a child. Social services make decisions for you as if you were a child. Staff have too much power over adults. They don't listen to you. Some staff do not believe you. They find it hard to work with you as equals. They do not listen like lawyers. Setting the scene, the case for an outcome approach. It's probably fair to say that the emphasis of safeguarding activities so far has been on investigation and conclusions rather than on improving outcomes. This has been strongly affected by the fact that national reporting has focused on this. Although outcomes are recorded, they are in reality outputs rather than outcomes. Increased monitoring or increased services, for example. The CARE Act 2014 this is a major shift. For the first time, this has been embedded in primary legislation with the introduction of the CARE Act 2014. It lays out adult safeguarding duties as opposed to powers for local authorities and its partners. These duties include making inquiries, setting up safeguarding adult boards and, where appropriate, undertaking safeguarding adult reviews. There's a duty to arrange where appropriate for an independent advocate. This is where a person has significant difficulty participating in the process themselves. Cooperating with each of its relevant partners. The Care Act of 2014 includes well-being principle. This deals with physical and mental well-being. Protection from abuse or neglect. Control over day-to-day -day life. Participation in work, education, training and recreation. Social and economic well-being, domestic, family and personal relations. Suitability of living arrangements. An individual's been able to contribute to society. A strengths-based approach. Phrases such as strength-based approach and asset-based approach are often used interchangeably. The term, though, Strength refers to different elements that help or enable the individual to deal with challenges in life in general. 
and in meeting their needs and achieving their desired outcomes in particular. Such elements might include their personal resources, their abilities, skills, knowledge and their potential, the social network and its resources, abilities and skills, community resources, is also known as social capital and universal resources. So the underpinning principles of the Act Empowerment, protection, prevention, proportionality, partnership and accountability. There is an ethos on making safeguarding personal. What does this mean? Well, it's about a shift from a process supported by conversations to a series of conversations supported by a process. It aims to ensure there's an emphasis in those conversations about what would improve an individual's quality of life as well as their safety. It aims to talk through with people the options they have and what they want to do about their situation. Making safeguarding personal is about engaging with people about the outcomes they want at the beginning and middle of working with them and then ascertaining the extent to which those outcomes were realised at the end. It's about understanding the range of legal and social work interventions that may be used. It's dependent on people's wishes and circumstances. While there may be challenges about how many social workers have the skills, confidence and feel they have permission to use a range of methods to work with and resolve those circumstances. Example outcomes might include being safe from harm or abuse, continued harm or abuse, feeling recovered from experiencing harm or abuse, having stated desires and results met, having their views, worries and wishes taken seriously, developing stronger networks that are protective, feeling in control and not being driven by an adult safeguarding process. Conversations about outcomes. Well, assessments should be conversational in style. They should, ideally, focus on what's important to the person, maintain a positive approach, start with a discussion about needs, concerns or problems that the person has. For example, the alleged abuse. Supporting people in setting goals and outcomes. Thinking creatively about how to support outcomes. Using a solution-focused approach. Note the PCF social work framework, intervention and skills domain. This states social workers should be competent to enable effective relationships or an effective communicators. Let's have a look at a joined-up approach to safeguarding and personalisation. These points are taken from Galpin and Hughes. They talk about a critical awareness of the decision-making context. They stress the involvement of the service user to the highest feasible level. There's a need for a clarity of thinking and awareness of their emotions and how they might impact on decision-making. They look at consultation with all relevant parties. There should be a systematic appraisal of options and their possible outcomes. It's important to evaluate the decision-making process and reflect on these outcomes. There should be a well-reasoned argument provided which incorporates all of the above. This should be consistent with available information and provide clarity as to how a decision has been made. Abuse listed in the 2004 Care Act. We've already covered some of this in a previous slide. But to remind ourselves, includes physical abuse, domestic violence, organisational abuse as opposed to the terminology institutional abuse, neglect, acts of omission, financial or material abuse, self-neglect, sexual abuse, discriminatory abuse, psychological abuse and now modern slavery. The Act also states that abuse can take place anywhere and be carried out by anyone. Incidents of abuse may be a one-off or multiple and affect one person or more. Anyone can witness or become aware of abuse. Professionals should be looking beyond single incidents to identify patterns of harm. Repeated instances of poor care may well indicate more serious problems. 
A reminder of the Human Rights Act, 1998. Rights under this act included a right to life, right to freedom from slavery or forced labour, a right to liberty and security, the right of all people to have a fair trial, freedom from torture or being treated in an inhuman way or degrading way, a right to respect for private and family life, home and correspondence, a right to freedom, thought, conscience and religion, a right to no punishment without law, to property, to freedom of expression, not to be discriminated against, a right to marry and found a family, a right to peaceful enjoyment of possessions, a right to education, a right to free elections. It's worth reminding ourselves, of course, of Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, starting with the basic physiological needs, moving on to safety, love, belonging, esteem, self actualization If we view adult safeguarding in this basic context, it makes understanding this approach, this new legal policy framework, far more understandable. Let's remind ourselves of Finkelhorn's Four Steps to Abuse. This came from a source book on child sexual abuse. It looked at motivation, wanting to do it, overcoming internal inhibitors, Overcoming external inhibitors, how you got your victim in the right place to do it. How you made the victim feel that it was their responsibility. Overcoming the victim's resistance. Try and think of these steps to abuse in exactly the same way for adults. Another way of looking at the whole concept of safeguarding adults is looking at life dimensions. From general adult well-being, taking on board their education, their social stimulation, family, social relationships, emotional well-being, social presentation, their identity, their health, but their mental capacity too. Promoting safety, giving guidance, promoting stability, enhancing self-care skills. And crucial to this as well as family and environmental factors. This might include family history and functioning, a person's wider family, their housing, their income how they integrate socially, resources available in their own community, employment. We move on to adult safeguarding response. The emphasis, since no secret, and safeguarding adults, has been on partnership working. This is now embedded in the new legislation. The local authority must cooperate with each of its relevant partners in order to protect adults experiencing or at risk of abuse or neglect. The benefits of partnership working should be obvious. Fundamentally, it means better information sharing. It means joining skills and expertise together, sharing these in a productive, cohesive way. The fostering of shared ownership and responsibility in relation to adult protection amongst agencies, particularly in areas of developing joint procedures and strategies. Inevitably, in partnership working, there will always be barriers. Some of these might include agencies not being fully committed, agencies not providing required resources, the usual lack of clarity about roles and responsibilities. Lack of information and protocols. Lack of information and sharing protocols. Agencies having different priorities. Delays being made in decision making, both at strategic and operational levels, usually because of the large number of agencies that can become involved in such work. So what specifically does the CARE Act say about carrying out safeguarding adults? Begin with a local authority. It must make inquiries that it considers necessary or cause inquiries to be made. The inquiries might include care and support needs, investigating abuse or neglect, looking specifically at people who are unable to safeguard themselves. The next two slides look in particular at decision-making processes and in terms of using Section 42 of the Act. We will explore these in more detail looking at specific case studies. But these slides are worth reading through 
in our own time to get used to the process, options available and duties that need to be carried out by local authorities and other partner agencies. Key things are about agreeing who will do what, timescales that need to be agreed and the important point that the local authority should retain accountability and oversight of the whole inquiry and the outcomes. In terms of getting a safeguarding plan together, timescales for review and monitoring have to be agreed. It should always be agreed who will be the lead professional to monitor and review the plan and ensure all the professionals are clear about their roles and actions. It's important to remember the major objectives of any inquiry that are made. Firstly, it's about the establishment of facts. It's about ascertaining the adult's views and their wishes. It's about assessing the need of the adult for protection, supporting and redressing how these needs might be met. It's giving protection from the abuse and neglect in accordance with their own wishes. It's making decisions as to what follow-up action should be taken with regard to the person or the organisation responsible for the abuse or neglect. And fundamentally, remember, we should be enabling the adult to achieve resolution and recovery. Let's look at initial action and decision making. Discussion needs to take place with the individual or their representative confirming that there is cause for concern and we need to agree outcomes and actions to be taken. These might include a number of things. For example, do we discuss with or report to the police? Do we talk directly to the organisation commissioning or delivering the care and support? Do we need to contact the Office of the Public Guardian or the Department of Works and Pensions? Do we use the internet helpline for advice and support? Talking to the GP or other health professionals might be necessary. Other regulatory or voluntary sector organisations may well be able to support as well. If the issue can't be resolved through these means, or the adult remains at risk of abuse or neglect, reminding ourselves whether this is established or suspected, then the local authority's inquiry duty under Section 42 will continue. This continues until it decides what action is necessary to protect the adult and by whom, and ensures itself that the action has been taken. The local authority continues to be the lead agency for making inquiries, and retains responsibility for the management of the Section 42 inquiry. It should assure itself that the inquiry satisfies its duty under Section 42 and challenge the body making inquiries if it considers that the process or the outcome is unsatisfactory. Main issues to consider are the safety and well-being of the adult. Generating a range of options about safeguarding that will help the adult stay in control of their life as much as possible. Seeking consent where practical and check that the adult has capacity to consent to the action or actions. The wishes of the adult are very important, particularly where they have capacity to make any decision about their safeguarding. Where the adult lacks capacity to make some or all decisions about their safeguarding, their wishes should still be taken into account, but balanced alongside risk to themselves or others, and this would include any children. Where the adult lacks capacity to make some or all decisions about their safeguarding, their wishes should be taken into account. These are balanced alongside risk to themselves or others. These include children. Whether or not the adult has capacity to give consent, Action may still be required if others are or will be put at risk if nothing is done or where it is in the public interest to take action because a criminal offence has occurred. Interventions in personal and family relationships need to be carefully considered. Abusive relationships don't contribute to the well-being of the adult but interventions which remove all contact with family members may also be experienced as abusive interventions. The right to safety should always be balanced with other rights, such as, going back again to the Human Rights Act, the right to liberty, autonomy and rights to private and family life. A 2007 report noted some barriers to identification of abuse. These included the victim being dependent on an abuser for basic survival, a victim assuming blame, fear of removal from home and institutionalisation, 
bonds of affection being stronger than the desire to leave. Guilt and stigma attached to issues around close relationships. Concerns about jeopardising the status of the family. Societal view of the private domain of the family. An ideological assumption that the best place to care is the family. All these were barriers to identification of abuse. Finally, a reminder of professional failures to detect or report abuse. What leads to such failures? Now, these might include a lack of knowledge. There may well be a lack of a clear identification process. Might be a lack of resources. May also be a tendency on the part of the professional to give protection of individual rights a high priority, including those who are perpetrators of abuse. As ever with such situations, our own personal feelings and our own cultural biases and attitudes come into play. These have to be acknowledged and worked through. Professional attitudes and standards inculcated in our own training and education, these all can have an effect and play a part in our failure to detect or report abuse. <laughs>